Thank you for joining us. I'm George Morris, and I'm here with our senior analyst team, Ryan Stanner for Fats and Oils, Tori Alden for Oilseed, and John Cusick for Biofuels. And we're about to jump into the MI report for the week of February 3rd, 2020. Cusick, would you like to lead us off with what's going on in the biofuels area? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so for this past week, we had a, a lot of headline announcements affecting the, the biomass-based diesel and especially feedstock world. Um, a lot of earnings reports were out this, this past week um, and a lot of uh, talk about future feedstock demand um, for renewable diesel um, and co-processing was announced in many of those earnings calls. So I wanted to take a minute and go through some of those as, as a lot of those were, were just sort of coming in in the last day or two. Um, some of the, the most interesting announcements to touch on were probably PBF closed the refinery deal in California with Shell. So that was Shell Oil selling their Martinez refinery across to PBF. Most notable in the announcements around the final closing of this refinery is the mention of a renewable diesel project now being a piece of that. And so that sort of officially places a California refinery on the map uh, for future um, feedstock demand going into that uh, potentially California market. In speaking about the, the close of that refinery, you've also seen some articles and some word about there being about eight refineries in all in the United States on the block. But Jacobson's been trying to track this list and um, as far as conversions, upgrades, and the likes, um, there's obviously a Washington State refinery for sale with Shell making that announcement recently, um, and an Alaska facility, I suppose, in the Pacific Rim. Um, the majority of the other six we believe to be in the mid-Cont and even in the uh, mid-Atlantic Northeast region. Um, so perhaps not as strong a candidate as that Washington State refinery now with Shell. Um, Moving into some of the earnings calls, both Exxon and Chevron had some, um, some challenging, some headwind numbers um, to report and, uh, and got quite a bit of um, talk about um, the oil and gas industry and, and where that's sort of performing in the scheme of things. And uh, quite a lot of mainstream media coverage on, on the earnings of both of those companies. Um, Chevron, however, did mention in their earnings um, plans of co-processing in California. And we had heard of it, some rumors through the feedstock markets um, over the past year that Chevron has been buying some refined soybean oil and had been doing some trials and testing. So Chevron coming out and speaking um, very directly about their ambitions to begin co-processing in California refineries. Another really notable um, piece that's come out of these earnings in the past week. Um, from there, uh, really right down the line, um, as we thought a week or two ago with the initial Phillips 66 announcement of the JV with REG sort of um, being um, broken, broken up there a bit and, and them going separate ways, Phillips 66 in their earnings call did talk about uh, finding the right location for a renewable diesel project and also spoke about um, a Northern California co-processing and their UK refineries in the, in the more co-processing upgrade or co-processing technology realm of future demand on feedstocks. Um, and then lastly, probably the, the other one to mention was really Valero. And I think a lot of, a lot of folks were talking about um, notably how Valero, you know, spoke and really headlined um, their earnings from the joint venture with Darling with the Diamond Green Renewable Diesel Facility. Um, and so I think for the most part, it's safe to say that you'll see them continue to build out capacity and move in that direction, given the clear success of that renewable diesel endeavor. Um, and then I think most notable, which caught a lot of people's eyes, was Valero really putting uh, the Verisun ethanol assets that they bought Wow, over 10 years ago now, probably, um, as being a very profitable uh, business unit for them. And I think that was interesting because of the contrast of seeing 
a major refiner that's taking that ethanol and blending it sort of uh, vertically into their gasoline. So on the downstream side, being successful with an ethanol production in that model versus what we normally see in ethanol, which is more of the vertically integrated from the ag and corn side into the production. And obviously we've seen that sector or that side of the ethanol producer um, struggling, quite frankly. So it was a real contrast to see Valero post those really, really interesting numbers. And I think the last thing I'll say is Valero is sort of showing themselves as this 2020 North American merchant refiner with these extremely strong sort of low carbon business units that are, you know, solving issues on both the distillate and, and gasoline sides of their core business. Um, it seems like it's a, it's a pretty good snapshot of a, of a model to follow. And, uh, and I guess uh, well, it has been really interesting in this past week in, in, in all these earnings is to see all this come out. A lot of confirmations of things we thought and have been, been you know, seeing companies moving towards. Um, and I, I think we're going to start to see you know, more and more announcements um, and more and more demand on these feedstocks. And uh, California LCFS, we had big numbers out of there. I'm going to let Tori dive into the, the details on that, but um, that program is tracking and expanding on its demand. And it is, it is uh, specific demand on renewable diesel and biodiesel is growing. Um, and uh, I think I'll pass it over to Tori to, to jump into really the numbers from here. Thanks, John. Um, so as John mentioned, we did get the um, LCFS report and we got the EIA report last week. Uh, and um, he's correct that uh, both biomass-based diesel production and renewable diesel production grew year over year. Biodiesel production came in just over 57 million gallons, which is up from just under 50 million last year. And renewable diesel grew to 133 from 79.7 .7 last year. Probably the biggest surprise in the report was a quarter over quarter decline in renewable diesel production from just over 160 million gallons in the second quarter of 2019 to 133.2 million gallons uh, in the third quarter. That was well below our expectation of 159 million gallons. But I don't think that that's something that necessarily will continue and certainly the price action in the LCFS credit values would suggest that uh, that there are uh, that the program remains pop popular and in the value of the credits will attract more supplies to the area uh, or to California as we move forward. The biggest uh, feedstocks for biomass-based diesel remain corn oil and yuco. I'll talk just to just briefly mention soybean oil. It remains relatively disappointing, just above 115,000 uh, gallons, which is down from 542 last year. The sharp decline in, in output using soybean oil caused us to reduce our forecast going forward by 50%. So for the fourth quarter, we only expect soybean oil to account for 265,000 gallons roughly, um, which would still be above uh, last year. And so even, even that may be optimistic. On renewable diesel, um, UCO remained the second, well, UCO and Tallow were the two most popular uh, feedstocks accounting for more than half of, of the total output with both of them just around just above 40 million gallons at 43.9 and, and just over 42 million gallons. In addition to the LCFS, uh, we also got data from the EIA. The EIA reported production biomass-based diesel production for November at 127 million gallons. Um, that was generally in line. It was 3 million gallons above our expectation based on the EMTS data. Biodiesel sales 
uh, totaled 122 million gallons, which was down from 141 million uh, the prior month and down uh, from last year when sales were 154 million gallons. So quite a sharp drop off. That's not surprising given the uncertainty about the blender's tax credit that we saw towards the end of the year. November was kind of the the depths of, of uncertainty. And so we expect that biomass-based diesel production is going to bounce back in, in 2020, although we still have the December report to get through and, and we don't expect much recovery there. And then January, February are, are seasonally the weakest years for biomass-based diesel production. And so uh, there could be another couple of months of, of kind of weak data or relatively low output anyway. Um, and so, uh, and then we would expect that, um, that production would recover starting in March, probably. And with that, I'll pass it back to George. All right. Uh, I just want to remind all of our attendees that if you have any questions, go ahead and submit into the Q&A section of the webinar, and we'll, sh we'll be sure to answer them after we're done presenting here. Um, Ryan, would you like to go ahead and cover the low CI feedstocks? Yeah, I'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, so this week we focused on the tallow market. Uh, you see here we have a little bit of a, a dip in the forecast coming up uh, before it picks back up in the summer months. And just to, to provide a little context to this price forecast, it's been a really, um, to say the least, interesting market over the last uh, month. We saw a record high change in January, day-to-day uh, -day trading. It was up five cents um, from one day to the next. And a big reason for that is um, very little interest from, from a number of sectors at the end of 2019, and everybody wanted material and coverage at the start of 2020. Uh, historically, the oleochemical industry will run down their inventories at the end of uh, the fourth quarter, and then they'll rebuild that pipeline in January. And I think while they were running the inventories down, palm oil fell, soybean oil was off, uh, biodiesel uncertainty tied to the tax credit just created an overall bearish environment, but the export demand was still there. So palm futures taking off incentivized uh, demand for Mexico as well as overseas and sellers went long. And so when those chemical buyers came in to, to get coverage, there wasn't much material left. And so they were having to come in and, and, and buy away material from these other sectors. And that's what's gotten the market to where it is now. So while that market's going up from uh, it was, I believe, 26 cents in early January to right at a 34 average now, so a huge increase. Uh, the coronavirus hits, there's a lot of fear in the market. Heating oils come off tremendously, soybean oils come off, palm oils come off, and so now there's all this bearish sentiment in the market, uh, which is impacting direction of the tallow market. Uh, but the nearby availability remains tight. I, I think we're going to see that situation mitigated. I think sellers are going to start to catch up on some um, shipments they may have been behind on, start to push a little bit more onto the sellers, and that's going to act as a catalyst to drive this market down uh, in the uh, it's probably mid-February position as uh, buyers start to put on March shipments. Again, um, I think we're going to see this market turn back around, uh, particularly if if uh, the, the fears that are in the market now aren't as bad as, as people thought maybe last week, and we're already seeing a little bit of price uh, reversal in some of the, the macros. Um, and, and just kind of looking at it, there, there's a lot of reasons for the market to, to go down, but there's also a lot of reasons for the market to go up long term. And, and really the LCFS, and, and to touch on what Tori and John said, there's tremendous feedstock demand ahead through these renewable diesel projects, as well as the renewable diesel facilities that are already in line. I think we're seeing um, Chicago equivalent prices for tallow and the LCFS, what tallow is, is it's not beef tallow, it's any animal fat. So yellow grease, choice white grease tallow, those are all commanding values close to just under what the Chicago BFT price is now. So that's going to offer some support and it'll continue to offer support uh, uh, long term. Additionally, I think we're going to see some lower yields as we go into the summer. There's uh, edible demand for hot dogs, hamburgers, like mechanically separated beef, um, and that's going to pull some of the raw material out of the tallow stream, which is supportive of the higher prices. Um, additionally, there's going to be 
uh, the, the, the first quarter of the year sees big Catalan feed numbers, so there's going to be big feed demand. Um, at present, you know, there's a lot of argument that the market should go down sharply tied to corn values, but in 2017, we saw uh, corn uh, BFT relative price to corn well above 400%, with cash corn at, you know, $4 a bushel in Illinois. That's supportive of a market over, over 30 cents FOB, if we're looking at the uh, uh, 2017 numbers. So um, with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and take any questions that may be out there. All right. Uh, before we do that, uh, Cusick and Tori, uh, either of you have any kind of insights on our gross processing margin or our RIN forecast that you want to offer? Go ahead, John. If you do, I'd, I'd, I don't really have that much to offer. Um, I, you know, I think right now we've seen sort of the low web in the relative values of, of soybean oil to energy. And it, in our forecast suggests that, um, that those values are, are going to favor production in, in the coming months at, at the same time that uh, production sort of would normally seasonally kick in. And so um, I, I think it just kind of mirrors the, uh, the overall trends, which have been really weak production recently, but uh, looking forward a couple months, I think we'll see a big recovery. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think, you know, what we're, what we're seeing in 2020, and I know Tori is, is much happier to see actual fundamentals driving a RIN value than just uh, Washington emotions. Um, but we're going to see more, more of a D4 RIN market that's following Hobo. Right. As we just saw before, you know, we continue to see hobo sort of going against production. So that gives us kind of that bullish push near term on the D4 RIN. Um, we still see this backwardation between the vintages, between the B19 and the B20. We've seen this occur before. It's sort of the uh, end of the compliance year accounting. Um, whether that sustains all the way through the next few weeks or gets cleaned up here quickly and that sort of B20 starts to perform out in front and, and revert to more of a contango type of a curve, um, I, I expect we'll see that clear up in the coming weeks. But uh, near term, we think, you know, especially the B20's got a little bit of, uh, of room to move north um, and, and the D4 complex in general. We've obviously seen the D6 catch a little, um, a little uh, movement higher here in the past few days. That's always helpful to push up uh, from below on the four. Um, but yeah, in general, I think near term, we see some, some, some bullish, um, maybe a little neutral on B19, bullish B20, um, B18, and, uh, and then longer term, as Tori's been projecting, um, you know, we start to see production starting to really kick in again in, in that Q2 period um, through the summer, um, and those numbers start to ramp up where we may see the RIN start to, to come off a bit. All right. Thank you, John. Okay, so in the EIA report uh, from the feedstock side, uh, soybean oil usage remained pretty disappointing at 527 million pounds. Um, that was about where we expected it to be, which was, was pretty weak, but down sharply from 704 million pounds last year. Canola oil usage was reported at 100 million pounds, which is down 15 million pounds from the prior month, but up from 75 million pounds last year. Again, we expect soybean oil usage to, to remain relatively low over the next couple of months. So like for December, we've got it forecast at 552 million pounds, bouncing up to almost 600 million pounds for January and February, and then closer to 700 million pounds starting in March. Canola oil, we think, is is going to remain. It's it's sort of been on a long term trend down, and we think it's it's going to remain relatively weak uh, into at least through the first half of of next year. And I think in in general, probably what you see as the mandates ramp up and production really ramps up, you see more of soybean oil going into biofuel 
production and obviously the the LCFS programs favor the low CI feedstocks and so I think a lot of that is going to tend to crowd canola oil out more canola oil probably ends up in the food industry and in that kind of thing and I think that partially explains why demand from the biofuel industry for canola oil is is going to remain relatively relatively weak on the on sunday the malaysian palm oil board is going to release its monthly supply and demand estimates traders are really focused on production and on trade which is sort of obviously they're always focused on those things but right now what they're really trying to get a sense of is is how long will this production shortfall relative to what you might normally think uh production levels would be will continue and this week we got an estimate from uh, one of the palm oil millers associations that suggested that production in January was down about 5% or a little less than 5% from December. That would continue sort of running below what uh, the seasonal pattern would suggest. And, and we're a little bit lower than that. We're down about 5.4% on, on our estimate. And the cargo surveyor data suggested that uh, exports remained weak from from really relatively weak numbers in December. And so we have exports down 8.1%. Again, that's a little bit more than uh, the cargo surveyor data suggested. But despite all of that, we still think that palm oil stocks fall to 1.7 million tons, which would be down almost 15% from December. And if that were to happen, we think that that will probably encourage uh, more of a recovery in, in palm oil prices and and in general in, in world vegetable oil prices. The key here really will be uh, whether soybean oil can continue to recover kind of during this period while we're building stocks. We got data from, uh, from NAS this week for uh, U.S. soybean oil stocks in uh, at the end of December, and stocks came in just under 2.1 billion pounds. This the difference that that followed a NOPA report that suggested stocks were really high, but the difference between the NOPA data and the NAS data was the smallest that it's been since NAS started reporting in May of 2015. And so that implied that domestic usage generally was was stronger than people were thinking and, and that accounts for a little bit of, of why the soybean oil market starting to catch a bid. The other part of that is just really we had gotten to, to kind of very much oversold levels and so a, a little bit of a bounce was was not a surprise. The question is whether that bounce will kind of continue. And then the last thing I want to cover is last week we also got data from the Canadian Oil Seed Processors Association about the canola crush. Uh, canola crush remained relatively strong in December. Crush margins were really good in December, and so canola oil production in Canada was 395,000 tons. Um, that was up about 35,000 tons from the prior month and up about a little less than 30,000 tons from last year. Canola, mar canola crush margins have come off as canola prices in Canada have, have dropped along with the rest of, of world vegetable oil prices. Um, but again, if, if we kind of expect this recovery to continue, crush margins probably will uh, start to recover a little bit. And we expect the crush to remain relatively strong, in part because in, in Canada, uh, China is one of their biggest customers for canola seed. And that market has essentially been shut off uh, since the Canadian government arrested the uh, Huawei um, executive and so while they're still exporting canola to countries like Europe and Japan um, 
there's still relatively more canola seed around in Canada than there would be in a, in a normal year. And so more of that we think is going to go to crushing and, and crushing probably for the year will test the limits of the, the Canadian industry's capacity to, to crush. Um, so we think that canola oil supplies probably remain pretty plentiful. Um, but it looks like domestic demand is, is going to pick up and we've got domestic demand going over a billion pounds for the first time uh, in, in uh, the first time maybe ever, the first time at, in, at the very least in, in a long time. Um, excuse me, I'm just trying to look and see. The first time ever um, in the 1920 marketing year. Uh, and so while the supply rises, we think demand will be relatively strong too. And against the backdrop of, of rising world vegetable oil prices, uh, canola oil prices probably remain pretty firm. All right, uh, we probably have just a few minutes for questions. So I'm gonna go over just a few questions that we have. Um, Tori, we'll stick with you on this one. Um, if crude oil prices continue to move lower, can soybean oil prices move higher? Uh, yeah, I, th I think there's there's two parts to that, right? So there's there's the the economic relationship that we talked about earlier, and and that had fallen to really the lowest levels we've seen in quite a while, and so um, doesn't mean that that relationship can't go lower, but it looks like that relationship is going to rebound in the in the next couple of months, and so I think even if um, even if crude oil prices continued to fall, the, the impact of that would be um, muted a little bit by the fact that uh, the profitability uh, at least was improving. That said, um, the other part of the equation really is the mandates. And because the mandates just simply require that uh, biofuels are produced and some portion of that, especially in the biomass-based diesel uh, industry is going to be produced from, from soybean oil and, and a significant part in the biomass-based diesel industry is going to be uh, produced from soybean oil. That's going to provide support for, for soybean oil prices even uh, if crude oil prices fall. Now, I, I guess it could have an impact on the timing of, of prices rising and prices falling, but I think there can be some separation there, even if crude oil prices continue to, to decline a little bit. All right, thanks, Tori. George, longer term, I'd like to just add on that. We, we do need to begin to think about longer term, the reality of what, we're talk, what, we're, what we were talking about in the beginning and these major refiner announcements, because effectively what co-processing brings is you're replacing crude oil with soybean, right? And so how those two things become interconnected moving forward as this new technology comes to these markets is going to be very interesting. And a lot about what we're trying to chronicle, monitor, and follow with the MI report. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, we have time for one more question here. Uh, so we're going to wrap up on this question. Ryan, this goes to you. Um, is there any direct impact from the coronavirus on the U.S. tallow market? Uh, directly, no. Um, indirectly, the, there could be some increased availability out of the uh, Australia and New Zealand market if uh, those trade flows get interrupted, which they, they may. Um, and you may see some uh, material be available for U.S. buyers out of those markets uh, down the line. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, John, Tori, Ryan, um, our attendees that have been on the call today. If you have any questions, you can still submit them. We'll try to get them addressed after this call. Uh, but next week, if you have any questions, go ahead and submit them early. We'll always be sure to answer them as much as we can with the time that we have. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap for today, and we look forward to having you on the call next week. Thank you, guys. Thank you, all attendees.